series, I, I, I said last week we're going to start a series on the last times, last days, the end of days. I hear this a lot, what's happened, what's going on. What does, we're in the last days. we got to be approaching the last days. The, time, the end times are near. And folks, there's a lot of misconceptions about the end times. What, but, and the biggest reception is the end times, the phrase the end times. The end times is not here. But there are several different last days referred to in the Bible, in the New Testament particular, even in the Old Testament. But the last, and we're going to kind of take these in order. And so the first last days that we're going to look at, we started last Thursday, we're going to look at it again today, is what we call the last days of the church. What is it going to look like before the rapture of the church. Because when you look at Revelation, that does not talk about what it looks like. Before. Well, it talks about the churches and things. But after chapter 4, the church is not even mentioned in the Revelation. It talks about the great, great, uh, great tribulation, that sort of thing. So, what is it going to be before the church leaves? Before the rapture of the church? Everybody know what the rapture is? We've talked about that before. It's when Christ comes. First let's look. First let's look. For, it's in it's in Thess Thessalonians. Yes. For the Lord Himself will descend with the shout, with the trumpet of God, with the voice of the archangel, and all the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and those of us who remain will be caught up in the air to be with Jesus forever and ever. And it says government. That's what we call it, 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 the word rapture is not used in the Bible, but it says change that means harpat, the Greek word is harpazio means caught up. Right? And that's what we refer to as the rapture of the church. The church taken out of this world. Christ, that's not the second coming of Christ. Alright? Because there's a lot of confusion there. So we teach, we believe, at just as Adam Calvary Church, in the rapture of the church. Pre-trib. Now, people don't agree with me out there. A lot of theologians, if you go to other places, you'll hear other things. But in Cowboy Church, that's what we believe. That's what we teach. If you don't agree with that, that's okay. That's okay. If you don't believe that Christ is going to come before the Great Tribulation, uh, at the rapture, then when He does come, just tell Him you're not ready because you're not supposed to be here yet, all right? But for me, I just... Anyway, so the question that, that I get asked a lot is, what is it going to look like? We talk about it all the time. There are several different passages in the Bible that talks about that. We talked about some in Matthew 24 last Thursday. Today we're going to look over in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I want everybody to take your Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Alright? Paul is telling a young Timothy here what to expect. For the future of the church. Because that's what this passage is about. What is the church. Going to look at. Look like. We're not worried. We're not going to be concerned about what the world. Looking is, is, is going to be looking at. Or what the world looks like. The world is going to just keep getting worse. And worse and worse. Than what we have now. But what Paul is talking about here. In 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, is. What is the church going to look like? Well, who's the church? Anybody who knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior makes up the church. What, are, what is the church going to look like? And to me, that's the most important question. What is it going to look like in the church in the last days before the rapture? Because once the rapture occurs and the great tribulation starts, that's a whole new ballgame. Alright? So we're looking at what... And, and, the, and the term, the last days, it's a technical current term, and it's used in several different places in the New Testament. And like I say, it speaks of the last days of the church immediately preceding the rapture of the church. Uh, the apostasy, that word apostasy... Anybody know what that means? It means a falling away from. 
uh, are discarding, of uh, falling away from the truths and beliefs that the church has in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's going to be a falling away from those doctrines, those core beliefs that the Bible states in the last days. Uh, and, and, the, and, and in Paul's day, it already started. In fact, if you study Scripture, the last days started when Jesus was upon the earth the first time. We were in the last days. There's not a set number of years. There's not a set number of days, per se, that, that's going to tell us when the rapture is. Or nobody knows. Not even Jesus himself. We are in the last days. That is correct. We are in the last days. But how long these last days last? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. And if anybody takes a stab at it, and tells you they haven't got it figured, figured out, then you better just walk away from it. Because even Jesus doesn't know. That's reserved only for the Father. That's what the Bible says. So how would a mere man... Well, a lot of folks got took it in in 2000, did they not? Anybody remember that? The turning of that? Oh my gosh. We even had folks that were singing with us, that was ministering with us, that was worried to death about the millennium coming in and scared, just scared, senseless. <laughs> I won't get into that. But Paul, it was warning the church, uh, and he did this in Acts chapter 20, verses 29 through 30, to at the church at Ephesus. He was talking about the false teachers that would be entering the church. Boy, we've talked a lot about false teachers. Why? It's because it will be so rampant in the last days. And one of the things, if I have a concern at all about this body of Christ, is this. What's it going to look like? And we talked about this other night. What's this church going to look like in 10 years from now? Look around. What's it going to look like in 10 years from now? Not just the people, but what we believe in, what we stand for. What's it going to look like? How well will our younger people carry on what we believe are the true biblical doctrines of the Bible that we're trying so hard and so desperately to set in ground here, set in stone. That's one of the reasons why I preach so hard at times because we have got to set in stone the truths of God's Word. And it can't be shaken. And the only way that it can be shaken is from inside, not outside. And that's what Paul's talking about Timothy to Timothy here. What is it going to look like inside the walls, not out there. And so he picks up in, in, in Timothy uh, chapter 3. And in fact, in Acts chapter 20, I'll tell you, it says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous uh, wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. We've already seen that here. And we've only been as just as that Catholic church in existence for, for two weeks shy of being eight years old. And we've already had people trying to come in and change doctrine, draw people. We still have people trying to draw people away by falsehoods. They're still out there. And folks, Paul is going to take, and he told us, and he told Timothy here, it's going to get worse. If you think this is a, 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 a message about, boy, it's going to get better, well, one day it is when the rapture comes. But until that time, it's going to get worse. And the reason why I'm wanting you all to know this is so that you won't be surprised. It's a lot easier to take things, bad things as they happen if you know about it, than if they come out of surprise for you. 
And, and so this whole message series, it, it, it's a warning. And we have to be aware of it as a New Testament church of what's going to happen. Of what's going to happen. You see the importance of this? It, this is probably one of the most important messages that I that in series that I've ever preached in all the years I've been preaching. Because so many people are not aware of what is actually going to happen. Not out there, because that can't hurt us. It's in here. You understand that? We get so shook up, and we refer to this, but not just its COVID thing, but all this other stuff coming down the pike through our governments and through all the outside world, that, that has no bearing on how we stand for the Lord. Or shouldn't. Alright? So, but do we understand the importance of this? You know, some of us are getting up there, you know, in 10 years. How many here is going to be 74, 75 and above in 10 years. Go ahead, raise your hand. You're going to be in your mid-70s or above in 10 years. Two young people look around. This thing is going to be in your hands. This is going to be in your hands. How are you wanting it to go? How, do, do, do you want, just as I am Cowboy Church, to continue in the Word and standing on God's Word? Or are you going to let other things filter in? Because once that starts, then the church as we know it is going to disappear. This is so important. Here in the last few weeks, I've really hit hard on you young people. And when I say young people, I'm saying anybody that's not on Social Security. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> this is your office. This is your office. And how it's going to respond to what's happening is it going to be a direct reflection on your own understanding. God's Word and how far you want to use God's Word to stay, make your stand on. Me? I'll stake everything I have on God's Word. Oh, I got a nice house to live in, but I don't have to live in that house. I've got a nice car or a nice truck. The other one's being repaired, but the one I am driving is a nice truck. It's a four. Got a nice one broke down. But I don't have to drive a truck. I can ride a bicycle or I can walk. You see, all these things that we're talking about that's important, well, the government can do things to take all that away. You know, we think, well, our land's paid for. Well, what if they raise taxes so much that you can't afford it? Well, it can happen. You know, or, or, or what if they put conditions on your employment where you can't go to work? Well, it can happen. So how are you going to deal with it? Are you going to take a stand on God's Word and trust Him? Or are we going to cave into what the government tells us we have to do that is contrary to what God's Word says? not going to get easy. It's not going to get easy. It's going to get harder and harder. And so the question remains, what are we going to do about it? So let's look at first, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1. All right? And we're not going to get through all this. I'm going it. But I trust each and every one of you will be back Thursday to finish up. And if we don't finish up Thursday, we'll finish up next Sunday on this particular section. Second, uh, Second Timothy chapter 3. We're going to look at all the way through 13. 
2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unholy, unthankful, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontent, fierce, despisers of good, those that are good, traitors, petty, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and leave captive silly, leave captive silly women laden with sins, led away with dire, divers lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambus withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning their faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs was also. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, my purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecution, afflictions, which came to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, but that persecutions I endured. But out of them all the Lord delivered me, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men shall, but evil men and seditions shall work, wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Our Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, that you lift up our hearts and open our minds to receive what it is that you want us to receive this morning. May your word, in the, by the power of the Holy Spirit, guide our lives, and that we come to the understanding of the truth in your word. Of course, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> How many here have ever read that section before? How many here thought of maybe what the world's going to look like? <coughs> well, you can get that appearance. Absolutely. But folks, the descriptions described in these, especially 1 through 9, is what the church is going to be looking like in the last days. This is not about a lost world. Paul is writing to Timothy about the church. Now that's, that surprises folks. But this is a section about what the church is going to be looking like. The church as a whole. And as we go through these, see if we remind you, not of anybody, but of ourselves. Amen? So, the question is, what are the characteristics of the church in the last days? And, and when you look at 2 Timothy, one of the major themes is suffering for Christ. We as Christians are going to, are going to be suffering for Christ. You see, Paul, Paul is in prison for his faith and he's awaiting a death sentence. And so he calls on Timothy to suffer with him as a good soldier of Christ. That's found in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. In this time, Christians are being persecuted throughout the whole Roman Empire. However, also in this passage, Paul is not talking about suffering from without, but suffering from within. Like I said, would you agree with this statement? Some of the greatest sufferings that we as Christians come across come from our church, people inside the church. It's true. Some of the greatest obstacles, some of the greatest sufferings that as a Christian that you face comes from people with them inside the walls of the church. Paul says, you got to understand this. This know also that are in, in the New American Standard Bible says, but realize this. Folks, there are certain things that we must understand. We must realize about the church, and if we don't, we're going to see it fall away. And it's sad because many have already fallen away because they didn't recognize what state or condition their heart was or what the times were like. So in, this, in describing the state of the church in the last days, Paul says that it will be difficult, <laughs> perilous. That's a word he uses. That word perilous in, in, in verse 1, 
It also means violent. It was used one other time in the New Testament to describe, if you remember the two demonics, they were in the tombs, and they wouldn't let people pass by. You remember that, Matthew chapter 8? That's the same word that's used here. Ah, would you thought that? And so that leads some theologians to think that these terrible, these things that we see here are demon inspired. Could be. Because folks, Satan does not want this church to. He doesn't want us to succeed. And when I mean succeed, he doesn't want us to lead other people to Christ. He doesn't want us to present the gospel so people can, can come to know Christ and have their lives and hearts changed. Satan doesn't want that. And he'll do anything he can to stop it. Make no mistake, and we'll see this as we go along. Satan has supernatural powers. Now, he does not compare to God. When, 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 when Satan and, and Jesus finally come to conflict, it's not much of a battle at all. Jesus wins. And Satan is a defeated foe. And we can live victorious. We, we must live victorious. But we don't want to be deceived either. And he is he's a master at deceiving. And so it makes sense that he would use his demons to infiltrate the church. Absolutely he will. Absolutely he will. Now don't go out of here and write start right now think people uh, write down the answer to the people you think might be demon possessed, all right? <laughs> That's not what we're talking about here, all right? <laughs> Besides, I already got my whole list made up, amen. So. <laughs> but the word times in first verse, it is not the Greek word chronos, which, which means a chronological order of time. It's from the word karyos, and it refers to seasons like fall and winter, spring or, or longer periods of time. Uh, and, and so in the last days of the church, there's going to be seasons of peril, and there's going to be other times of relative peace. But as we go farther and further and get closer and closer to the rapture, these times of peace will be less. These times of peril will be greater. Oh, I wish I could. I wish I could bring to you all the messages. Wow, everything's just okay. I wish you could. That don't you worry about a thing. God loves everybody. And, and He's going to forgive everybody. And you just keep living like we are. And everything will be alright. I wish I could do that. No, you don't. But it would be true. And it would be scriptural. See, what I've, what I've discovered is a lot of people want to be scriptural, but they want to keep their sins, too. They want to be churchy, but keep on doing what they want to do. And those two don't mix. Those two don't mix. Now, I'm not saying living perfect. That's I'm not, what I'm saying. That's not, don't, don't read into what I'm not saying. Paul is warning Timothy here. In fact, he says in verse 5 to avoid these kind of people that we just read about. He's, he's talking about things that's happening in his time, and he's talking about things, the same thing that's going to be happening all the way through the end of the church age, which is our time. So when we read these passages, it's not just about Paul talking to Timothy. It has a direct relevance to who we are today. Christ has not come again 
in the rapture. The church has not been raptured at yet. And so this has a, a direct impact on us. On us. The last days, in fact, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, it says, After God spoke long ago in various portions, uh, and in the last days He has spoken to us in the Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, and through He created the world. You see, I said a while ago, the last day started when Jesus came the first time. And so, why is Paul informing Timothy about the last days? Well, it's because Timothy, like we said, needed to understand the nature of them so we won't get discouraged. Anybody here ever been discouraged in church before? I'm serious. Anybody ever been discouraged in church And then you fell away. That's the whole purpose of this. Is so that we won't get discouraged about what's happening. And we won't fall away. We will stand. We will stand. You're not going to hear too many messages about this. But you are going to hear one here. In John chapter 16 verse 1. He was talking to disciples. And he said, Christ said, I have told you all these things so that you will not fall away. Why would he tell us that if there's not a danger of us falling away? He's warning us. Look at these things. Listen to these things. Take these things to heart so we won't fall away. We won't fall away. Alright? So, here's the big question. What characteristics of the church in the last days can be, so what are the characteristics and how should we respond? Well, first of all, in the last days, the church is going to be full of false believers. If you're making an outline, that should be Roman numeral number one. The church in the last days are going to be full of false believers. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 and 5. What's it say? Well, look at all these kind of characteristics from two to five. Lovers of their own self. By the way, lovers of your own self, that's number one. That's the very first thing. And it has to do, lovers of your own self has an integral part in every else, in every, in every one of these other ones. Every one of them. What's the characteristics of people in the last days? <laughs> well... You want to know something? The terrible times that we're going to see is not because of events outside, but they're caused by people inside. What makes these last days so terrible? Well, folks, there's going to be a lot of folks who's going to profess Christianity, but they look nothing like the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In verse 5, it talks about how they had a, a the out, the outward appearance of religion, but they disregarded its power. This means that they, the outer trappings, of, uh, they looked like a Christian. They went to church. They, they, gave, they sang some hymns, what we like to sing. Might even give some money. They wanted to go on mission trips and did missions. But they lived ungodly lives that proved that they had never really experienced Christ's saving power. You can look like a Christian, you can act like a Christian, but that doesn't mean you are a Christian. This is exactly what Christ talked about when he, when he warned the disciples uh, of the kingdom in Matthew chapter 13. He, had, he said the kingdoms are tares and are wheat, verse 36 through 43. Good and bad fish. Talked about true and false believers. Talked about yeast that's in flour, how it spreads through the whole world. And, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 through 6, it talked about how sin would enter. And so Christ is describing how evil would spread and saturate the church. We all know churches. We all see churches. But make no mistake, folks. 
I'm not talking about other churches. We're going to deal with just as I am Cowboy Church. Because you are my responsibility. Not that church down the road, not that church over there, but just as I am Cowboy Church. And we've had good and evil in here. We have had both good and evil in here. Just short, eight short years. Can you imagine some of these churches have been around for 150? What they've gone through? Jeff. Keep your head still, all right? 
And if you have to, I'm, I'm giving you permission right now. If you need to close your eyes or you want to turn your head, go ahead. I don't want to know because I've got my own battles to be concerned with. But do you ever put yourself above God? I think we all know the answer to that. Would anybody dare, and if, and if you believe that, if you believe that you've never done that, we need to talk. <laughs> we need to talk. <laughs> Lovers of themselves, the number one problem we have in our churches today. And to me, it's the number one problem in, in our church today. <coughs> Too many people. And you're thinking, well, all he's talking about is, is, is having fun and all. You ever put your problem ahead of God? You ever put what problems you're going through? You're thinking they're more important than what your love for the Lord is and what your responsibility If you read down in here, we'll skip down a minute here. Uh, and I don't like doing this, but I want to skip down. If you think you have problems, look at verse 10. But Paul said to Timothy, but thou hast known fully my doctrine, matter of life, faith, on Luke verse 11, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, and I called him at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. You think you got a rough? Look at what Paul went through. You think you got a rough? Look at what Jesus went through. And what happened? God delivered them out of all of them. Got up here this morning. And y'all have been working on the deck back here in the back. This is the Yogi's back door. <laughs> and so we went to the lumber yard. And I had a whole bunch of uh, four Jewish hangers in the shed. I, and I don't know when I got them. Don't know how long we're going to work. Don't even know why I remember. But I took them over to the lumber yard and I said, I don't know if I got these here, but if you'd like to have them, we'll just make a trade. So we counted them up, and I thought, man, we're going to spend some more money. Don't want to do that. And Janice, and she's fretting about the money, and, and, and oh, do we have to buy anything else? Well, yeah, we do. Well, it come out where instead of spending $100, we only had to pay $50 because we had all those old four choice hangers, you know? And, and that sort of thing. And so, I got up thinking, well, I gotta, I can't hold this post up by myself and get it leveled out. Boy, terrible problems. Everybody, anybody feel for me? Any, any hearts breaking because I'm going through such ordeals? Well, it's terrible. Terrible. I had a piece of bacon get stuck in my tooth back here. Terrible. And I didn't get a toothpick to get it out. It kept irritating. And now my gum's sore. Boy, do I have a rough. And I'm going to be honest with you. This afternoon, we're going down to Merrimack. Is that the name of it? Somewhere down there. And folks, I don't like to float. I hate to float. But this old fat boy is going to sit in his chair right in the middle of the river and let the river run over me. Terrible. Terrible. Yeah, river runs through it. <laughs> Would you hush? I'm trying to get serious here, all right? But when you look at what Paul went through, good grief. Not so hard, is it? Things don't look so bad. And that's what we're talking about. Lovers of self always put themselves, even the good times and the bad times, ahead of God. Ahead of God. And that's not what he calls to do. Lovers of self. Lovers of money. That's the next one. Lovers of money. That's covetous. Now, since the, 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 the self-love is dominant, well, the love of money naturally occurs because... When we love ourselves, we try to make all, get all the money we can acquire to fulfill everything we love about ourselves. And 
Folks, I've known folks that there ain't enough money in the world to fill that void that they love themselves so much. Amen. <laughs> ah, we cater to all our desires. In fact, do you realize this? If you're listening, say amen. amen. Do you realize that there are preachers and religions out there that will try to make money off of this? Is that, is anybody surprised about that? You got them little boys that swooped their hair over. Swooped up, not back, over. And they, they look, they're on TV, they look at you with them beady eyes. Or maybe they're stargazing eyes. They'll look at you and say, if you send me 1995, I'll send you your prayer call. And I'll pray for you. Or they'll walk through some auditorium filled with money. And always the miracles happen after the offering statement. You ever notice that? You know, when we started Calvary Church, you know, just a few years ago, I had the bright idea, you know, there was an old boy down in Atlanta, Georgia. He not only had one jet airplane, he wanted another one. So he kept passing the offer and played around until they got enough money in Georgia to get him a new airplane. And I come to you all saying, I don't want an airplane, I just want a fishing boat. Got one, didn't you? I don't guess I looked at you with enough beady eyes. Maybe my hair wasn't swooped over enough. Maybe I need to get a wig that I can swoop it over. Amen? <laughs> Robert, where can I go get a, 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 a wig mullet? Can you swoop that over your head? You're going to be a TV evangelist, I can tell you. I'll see how it works. But you know, <laughs> in first hand, somebody, I'm going to go over. In, uh, just a, uh, in first Timothy chapter 6, verse 5.
because here is where it starts as body of Christ. We know Christ is the head. But my life, just like the Apostle Paul said in verse 10, that look at his life. You know what manner of life I have. You know what, what manner of life I lead. Now I can fool you, but eventually it'll come out. You all know that. Does that mean I'm perfect? No. But what it should mean and what it does mean is I try to live in a godly example. And a lot of my britches got holes in the knees. It's because a man of God needs to be on his knees more than his backside. 